All looks good. Yes, Dr. Pawan, can you yeah. click on slideshow view? Yes. Okay, uh, so let's begin. So my today's talk is on updates on management of India Excel Sibilitis. Uh, so I will keep uh, uh, you engaged for the next 30 minutes or so. So to begin with, uh, the incidence and etiology of pediatric status epilepticus. Uh, the incidence, as you can see, is uh, very high, almost five times compared to status epilepticus in adults. So it's a very common pediatric emergency. And if you see that under one year of age, the incidence is much higher. And the etiology of pediatric status can be varied, but prolonged febrile seizures is one of the most common uh, etiologies, followed by acute symptomatic causes like CNS infections, electrolyte imbalance like hypocalcemia and hypoglycemia. Or it could be remote symptomatic cause like a case of cerebral palsy or previous stroke. Or it could even be the first presentation of an idiopathic epilepsy syndrome. So let's start with the typical clinical history of a three-year-old child who is brought uh, with a generalized convulsive seizures, which started in sleep, and when brought to the emergency, it's still actively convulsing. So, as we all know, the initial management comprises a quick assessment and stabilization of the airway, breathing, and circulation. At the same time, you have to carefully observe what is the type of seizure. Is it a tonic, tonic clonic, or a clonic seizure, or even a myoclonic status? And you have to see if it is focal or generalized, because that would give you vital clues. At the same time, it is very important to focus on the eyes during the examination, because sometimes the active convulsions might have stopped, but the signs of seizures might, might still be seen in the patient's eyes. At the same time, a very focused and quick history will be important, especially you want to know if this is a febrile status or if this is an unprovoked seizure, whether the child is a known case of epilepsy, if so, is he on medications and was there any missing of the doses? And you want to establish if this is a provoked or an unprovoked seizure. Then you uh, decide on the first line of medication and obviously check for the treatable causes like glucose because that itself might suffice. When it comes to first line medication, there is good evidence of using benzodiazepines and this is the established practice worldwide. The reason being benzodiazepines act on the GABA receptors, which are the predominant inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And we have a wide range of uh, uh, benzodiazepines available that can be utilized using various routes, including applying to any of the mucosal surfaces so like buccal or rectal, giving intramuscularly or intravenously, whatever is quickly available. The evidence for benzodiazepines is pretty robust uh, for most of the uh, medications and most of the routes. And if uh, intramuscular midazolam is used, then it is shown to be one of the most effective medications because of the rapidity with which it can be administered and get absorbed. Uh, and in certain countries, free field civilians of midazolam are also available. Coming to the safety of benzodiazepines, there is usually uh, some scare amongst emergency physicians to use them uh, because of the risk of respiratory depression and drowsiness. There is no substantial difference between the three main benzodiazepines as far as respiratory depression. However, we know that children tolerate benzos much better than adults uh, per uh, kilogram of their body weight. There is one distinct advantage of using lorazepam if it is available that the duration of action is up to four hours, whereas the rest of the benzos, as we know, have a short duration of action and get reabsorbed in the body fat within 30 minutes of administering. So the take home message here is that giving benzodiazepine without loss of time 
is the most important step rather than what benzodiazepine you are using or what food you are using. At the same time, utilizing the proper doses is very important and don't underdose because that might lead to failure of seizure abortion. In case the patient continues to have convulsive seizures, we need to understand when should we call this a status epilepticus. So we all know the pathological definition, which has been in work for several decades, uh, and we have learned as if that as medical students of seizures lasting more than 30 minutes, or recurrent seizures for 30 minutes or more without gaining consciousness in between. Why 30 minutes? Because in the past, many animal experiments showed that irreversible neuronal damage occurs if the seizure, we are talking about convulsive seizure, is allowed to uh, continue for 30 minutes or more. However, in practice, uh, we are not concerned with the definition. We want to prevent this from happening. What we know is that most convulsive seizures terminate within five minutes. Uh, from clinical practice, and those that don't are likely to be self perpetuating. Why? Because the brain has certain inhibitory mechanisms to stop the seizure from continuing, but in certain cases it fails in about 30% times, those mechanisms fail, and then the seizures become self sustaining. And this is the reason why the International League Against Epilepsy or the RLAE came up with the operational definition of status epilepticus a few years back as a seizure that continues more than five minutes or two discrete seizures without regaining consciousness in between. It takes into account two time points. T1 is the five minute point after which the seizure is likely to continue by itself without stopping. So if a seizure reaches T1, it is unlikely it will stop by itself. And T2 is the 30 minute uh, arbitrary time point at which point there will be neuronal damage. But what we want is to abort the seizure sometime between T1 and T2. So we don't want ever to reach T2. But how accurate are these time points? So T2 was derived mainly from animal experiments where uh, animals were subjected to electroconvulsive seizures using certain chemicals. Uh, however, uh, we still are not entirely sure what is the best time uh, or the, the most, uh, the longest time before which the seizures can start causing neuronal damage in humans. However, this provides a useful estimate. 30 minutes provides a useful estimate and it mainly applies to convulsive chronic chronic seizures. When it comes to partial seizures, absence seizures or myoclonus, uh, the uh, evidence is much more uh, uh, bleak. We don't have enough evidence. So we always recommend, uh, or most international protocols recommend a second dose of benzodiazepine after five to 10 minutes of the first benzo being administered. So if you look at most of the international protocols, they mention to wait for 10 minutes. This is because it takes an average of six minutes for most of the benzodiazepines to have their effect on the brain. So if you keep giving benzodiazepines very rapidly in succession, it might lead to toxicity and respiratory depression. At the same time, you have to also be very careful to ask the history if the patient had a benzodiazepine at home or in the ambulance. And if this is the case, you should not use a second dose in the emergency. You should just go straight to second line medication. There is good evidence for benzodiazepines in clinical practice if they are administered within 20 minutes of seizure onset. In that case, almost 70 to 86 percent of seizures can be successfully aborted. However, as duration of seizure increases, the available GABA receptors on which these benzodiazepines work, they decrease. And so their efficacy progressively decreases. So this is what happens in an established status epilepticus. Now this is a very oversimplified uh, kind of uh, diagram, but you can see that what happens is the inhibitory GABA receptors on which the benzos work, within seconds to minutes of seizure, they start getting internalized. 
Whereas the excitatory receptors, which work based on glutamate, so there are two types, NMT and AMPA receptors, they come onto the surface of the neuronal cells. So this is known as uh, receptor traffic. We don't quite understand these mechanisms, how they happen, but this is supposed to be the progressive image failure. And that is why uh, when it comes to second line medications, we need medications with different mechanism of action. As is seen from the graph uh, here, uh, we have a host of medications in our armamentarium which have different mechanisms of action. However, not all of them can be administered intravenously rapidly. The ones that we that can be are phenytoin or phosphonytoin, which work on the sodium channels, uh, levetiracetam or Keprol, which works on the presynaptic vesicles, which release the glutamate, so it prevents the release of glutamate. Sodium monofluoride, we don't quite understand exactly how it works, but it, has, yes, it is supposed to have a lot of different mechanisms of actions. And finally, we have phenobarbital, though in practice it is quite a useful medication. We have to remember that it does work still on GABA receptors, and we already discussed that these GABA receptors are progressively depleted as the status progresses. When it comes to using phenytoin versus phosphenytoin, uh, one should remember that phosphenytoin is a prodrug of phenytoin. The advantage is that it can be administered pretty quickly and is more tolerable because it causes less degree of cardiac arrhythmia, hypotension, as well as extravasation injury, which is a real nasty problem with phenytoin. However, contrary to popular belief, it does not act any quicker than phenytoin because it has to be converted into phenytoin by metabolism in the body. However, when you have the choice, tend to use phosphenytoin as the correct dose, which is calculated with phenytoin equivalence. Now coming to other second line medications. So traditionally phenobarbital has been used, but gradually is falling out of favor for the reasons mentioned earlier. However, it still remains due to tradition as the first preferred medication in neonatal seizures and early infantile seizures. However, it can uh, cause respiratory depression and hypertension, and you should be aware of this. Now, since last many years, people have been using heparin and sodium monofluoride. However, till recently, there was no good evidence, especially in pediatrics. But then recently, a randomized, well controlled a clinical trial was conducted and published in 2020, known as the Established Status Epileptic Screening Trial, or ESET, which uh, had a wide age range, uh, starting from three to four years of age, right up to the geriatric age. And they compared these three medications phosphonytoin, sodium valproid, and levetiracetam as second line in benzodiazepine refractory status. As you can see here, all of them are pretty much similarly effective, terminating half of the benzodiazepine refractory seizures. You have to be aware of the doses that have been used, which you know many times we are scared to use uh, in clinical practice. So Kepra is used in a dose of 60 mg per kilo and sodium monofluoride 40 mg per kilo. Now frequently we see that if you use Kepra in a dose of 20 mg per kilo loading dose, it doesn't really, is not very effective. One has to remember to use the correct doses, at least 40 to 60 mg per kilo of Kepler. So the conclusion from this ESAC trial was that all age ranges, uh, you can use either Kepra, phosphonytoin, or Valproate with equal treatment success, which is around 50% of the patients. So any of these three can be considered as the first choice, second line medication. So based on what we have talked and the evidence we have seen, uh, uh, modern day status epilepticus protocol might look like this. So a patient with convulsive seizures, you give two doses of benzodiazepines with an interval of five to 10 minutes in between. And these are supposed to act in almost 70 to 86 percent of the patients provided very importantly that they are given within 20 minutes of seizure onset. Uh, in those cases which are refractory, the, the two doses, you can either use phenytoin, epra, or sodium valproate with a 50% efficacy. Now, there is one very important point to be made here 
The duration of infusion for phenytoin is at least 20 minutes or even 30 minutes, whereas Skepra can be given very quickly uh, and there have been studies giving it over five minutes without any side effects. And as this is a time critical emergency, it can save valuable time. In case the patient does not respond to the first two line, two different medications, then it is said to be fulfilling the criteria for refractory status epilepticus. There seems to be a paradigm shift happening in designing the status epilepticus protocols. And this is a commentary from a paper by one of the lead authors of one of the recent trials from New Zealand. What he says is that given the risk and the resources needed to intubate the patient, it makes a sense that algorithms will actually change. And in New Zealand, uh, they are already in the process of changing the algorithm to two doses of benzodiazepines, followed by Kepra and then phenytoin, and then rapid sequence induction with anesthesia. And they cite the main reasons as being having the number of children being recommended intubation by the guideline compared to a guideline using just Kepra or phenytoin alone. So they are using first Kepra and then phenytoin only at the ex expense of an additional 10 minutes for the whole protocol. So this can halve the number of children exposed to phenytoin uh, with its serious side effects. And uh, it can also reduce the need for going into the IC. So now, uh, when it comes to refractory status epilepticus, uh, the evidence is uh, much bleaker than what we have seen uh, so far. There is no clear uh, evidence and there are no randomized trials here. Part of the difficulty here is because every institution does different things based on what is available and the expertise that is available as, as far as uh, the PICU uh, support and anesthetic support is concerned. So the options are you can use an alternative second line medication as we have already seen in the previous slide. And then if the patient doesn't respond, proceed to rapid sequence induction to intubate the patient. So this means inducing anesthetic medications like midazolam, hyopectum, or propofol. But we have to remember that by this stage, all these children are going to need airway support and uh, your PICU or anesthesia team should be at the bedside of the child. Uh, it depends really on what each institution is comfortable with and what the resources are. One thing to remember is that if you use anesthetic agents, it is vitally important to use them under continuous EEG monitoring because uh, they are monitored by achieving birth suppression pattern or electrical control of seizures, especially thiopentone and propofol, and sometimes even midazolam. Uh, and uh, it is even vitally important to man you, you know, uh, monitor these children with EEG because paralytic agents are used while intubating the children. So you might not actually see any clinical signs of seizures, but the child might still be seizing when you do the EEG. Uh, most of these children, unfortunately, land up on inotropic support and all the complications associated with that. And also, the more the time that the seizure goes on, the more chance that this is not going to respond easily. So when it comes to anesthetic agents, uh, the two main ones are midazolam and thiopentone. Uh, we prefer to use midazolam uh, because both, both of them have several levels of evidence. But midazolam is preferred in many pediatric centers because it can be easily titrated on, in either direction up or down. However, there is one problem. Uh, it uh, tends to develop early tolerance uh, by a phenomenon known as tachyphylaxis, which means that you need progressively higher and higher infusion rates to achieve the same degree of seizure control. And there is a high chance of seizures recurring when you mean uh, midazolam and hence Many of these children need to be started on additional uh, long-term medications. As far as thiopentone, uh, the endpoint is usually birth suppression on the EEG, uh, and it is more liked by the PICU teams. However, you know it can cause hypotension most of the times needing on inotropic support. However, that is not a priority when you are dealing with status 
Bringing the status under control is the priority. You can always treat the cardiovascular side effects. Propofol is not really preferred in pediatric age group because it can sometimes cause mitochondrial dysfunction, leading to the propofol infusion syndrome, which can be fatal. As far as topiramate is concerned, it's a very useful adjunctive medicine. Uh, can never be used in the acute emergency because it cannot be given intravenously. But it is a very useful add-on medication and uh, can be given by the nasogastric tube. And it, it tends to be very useful when we want to especially give uh, medications like midazolam. Now, if we are really stuck and the patient does not stop seizing, the other two options that we can use are ketogenic diet and immune therapy, including steroids and IVIG. Ketogenic diet has especially been found to be quite useful in the febrile infection related status epilepticus, or also known as fires, which is a very rare, uh, but not that rare also. We do see one or two cases every year. Uh, syndrome of devastating uh, acute onset seizures in a previously normal child after a minor trivial febrile illness. However, one should have the expertise to institute the ketogenic diet in a patient who is already very sick because of the metabolic complications that the ketogenic diet itself causes. Also, many of these patients develop, you know, gastric paresis, uh, aspiration, aspirates and things like that. So it is not very easy to, uh, you know, quickly build up the ketogenic diet, but it remains an option in those who can tolerate it. As far as steroids and IVIG, uh, they are many times used because what we know is once uh, status epilepticus becomes very well established, there is a big role of inflammatory cytokines uh, and interleukins. Uh, and uh, especially this is also true in autoimmune encephalitis like NMDA or Rasmussen's. So in those cases, we tend to use these medications and even sometimes plasma exchange very quickly. Uh, one should remember to use pyridoxin in all children who are under 18 months of age with undiagnosed as epilepticus because we know that pyridoxin dependent seizures can present up to 18 months of age. Just last couple of slides. Uh, super refractory status is when the status is not responding even to 24 hours of anesthetic therapy. It's very rare, uh, but uh, we do see these cases caused by many different conditions. And the treatment protocols largely are a mixture of what I already talked, and we sometimes even use anecdotal medications like ketamine and nicotine. Uh, there is a very important uh, uh, problem of electroclinical dissociation when the status epilepticus is uh, treated. Uh, this happens when the conversion stop, the clinical conversion stop, but the electrical seizures remain. And uh, in one of the well-conducted studies, almost a third of the patients were uh, shown to have this on conventional EEG. And almost half of these children even had electrographic status epilepticus. Obviously, the uh, effect of this is equally devastating as convulsive status and hence should be treated aggressively. Now, many uh, facilities don't have uh, facilities for monitoring EEG continuously, but many PICUs these days do use CFAN or amplitude integrated EEG, which can also be very useful to monitor for this phenomenon. My last uh, but one slide uh, is about uh, anti epileptic drug levels in the management of status. Now, uh, many times what we have noticed is patients require supranormal or supratherapeutic levels of certain medications like phenobarbital, which are almost double the levels that we would usually use in clinical practice. However, uh, we should be using them uh, because this is as per the recommendations of the Critical Care Society that uh, we should be guided not by the drug levels, but by the continuous EEG findings. Uh, an importance of a standard protocol in every institution cannot be overemphasized because status is a time critical emergency and we ought to give the right medication, the right dose at the right time. And it has been shown uh, in studies that if uh, a proper protocol is not in place and not followed, 
uh, then it leads to inadequate therapy with a mortality up to 45%. And this certainly is avoidable. So to conclude, uh, the adage that time is brain is not just relevant to stroke, but also for epilepsy and status epileptics. It is very important to have a seamless local protocol which all the physicians in the hospital, right from the emergency to the general pediatrics and the ICU are aware of. And uh, you should treat any seizure lasting more than five minutes as a status epilepticus. It is vitally important to train parents and schools to give the early dose of benzodiazepine. In fact, we find that this is usually the missing link in uh, management of status. Uh, Phenytoin, Kepra, and Valvoid, as I have already shown you, have equal efficacy. And these days, there is an increasing trend to using levetiracetam because of its better side effect profile over the other medications. An outcome depends on the timely management as well as the underlying etiology. Finally, I would like to thank with a deep gratitude our patients at uh, the Pipa Hospital and our dear colleagues from whom we always keep learning new things. Thank you very much, and uh, I can take some questions if you want. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Boaba. Uh, this uh, question is open for the uh, auditorium, so you can ask any question about uh, related to the to this uh, presentation to uh, to the to the presenter. Doctor Abdullahi. <laughs> Uh, I can see some questions here uh, in the question answer box. Uh, there is one question about role of mannitol or steroids. I think steroids are already covered. Mannitol is not a you know, per se uh, anti seizure medication, but yes, uh, many uh, established refractory status epilepticus do cause cerebral edema, and it's a clinical decision to, to use uh, medications like mannitol. You have to remember that uh, uh, these can. Uh, cause other problems uh, like you know uh, problems with vasculinity and things like that. So it has to be done under the DICU uh, team input. Uh, there is one uh, from Dr. Jehan who asked the experience of the use of ketamine in superinfectory status. As I already alluded to in my talk, yes, ketamine we have used in a few refractory cases. Uh, in fact, you know, the, the problem with all using all these medications is that there are no good studies because, you know, uh, this type of super, super refractory status is so rare and it is even more difficult to uh, do randomized trials for these cases. But it does tend to sometimes work uh, because it has got a different mechanism of action on the NMDA receptors. Uh, so, yes, in super, super refractory cases, uh, we do use ketamine. 